Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vic Chow, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Sony exhibit here at CES. Everywhere you look this year, you'll find exciting new innovations from Sony. And whether you're in our visual entertainment or music entertainment areas, or visiting our digital imaging or PlayStation displays, all of these innovations will provide you with an incredible user experience. Because as a fully integrated company, only Sony is capable of delivering the ultimate in entertainment, the same way the creators intended. And when it comes to digital imaging, the Sony Artisan of Imagery program features some of the most creative and respected professional photographers from around the world. Each has their own unique style and vision, but they all have one thing in common. They create their work using a Sony Alpha camera. Chris Burkhardt is a self-taught American photographer and artist based in California's Central Coast region. His work encompasses everything from surf and the outdoors to adventure, lifestyle, and travel subjects. Chris takes a photojournalistic approach to his editorial projects using multiple forms of media and including natural light to capture the most humanizing moments. Please welcome Chris Burkhardt. Thanks, Vic. Thanks so much, Vic. I appreciate that. You guys, I'm so honored to be here. And one of my absolute favorite things is being able to share my truly most humanizing aspects of photography. And to me, I guess what I, the, the way you could really summarize aerial photography is that for a man to truly appreciate the earth, it's been said he has to rise above it. And I don't think that that could be more true when it comes to these types of subjects. Now, throughout the last maybe um, six or seven years, I've kind of had a fascination, right? A fascination with looking at the world from ideally a different perspective in some capacity. Um, you know, everybody, everybody obviously knows the, the powerful aspect that drones can bring, but there's really nothing more fulfilling than, than sticking your head or your arm or your body out of a moving plane at 190 miles an hour. You feel the wind hitting your face and you're looking down at the earth from a perspective that you have never seen. Now, I, I'd, I'd, I'd venture to say that since we very first envisioned this idea of flight, um, it's really been a journey in, in humans trying to discover and understand their world from a much different perspective. So today, while we're in this tech conference, I'm gonna hope that I can take you guys on a little bit of a visual journey, a little bit of an escape from all the technology and all this stuff, and, and hopefully get back to why we're really here, which is the opportunity to experience the natural world. I mean, that's why we use technology to enhance this experience. We, we use it to, to bring us closer to places, well, like this. The Canadian Rockies, shot from above, looking down at a small glacial lake right at the mouth of one of these beautiful mountains, sky setting in the background. Now, one of my, my favorite things is that aerial photography gives us the opportunity to actually understand our world in a much different way than we have before. Um, I've been to Iceland 33 times. Um, over the course of my career, over the last 10 years, it's taken me there from everything you could imagine, from producing TV spots for Super Bowl commercials to personal projects to surf trips. And it's been one of my favorite places to really explore this idea of aerial photography. And what I realized was all of these incredible streams and rivers and the, just the stuff you would drive over that you'd kind of yawn as you'd pass. As soon as you get in the air and you look down, it, it takes on a completely different shape. For example, this is the Trugnau River mouth in the middle of October, shooting down from about 2,000 feet out of the small window of a Cessna 172 shot with a 70 to 200 lens, basically just looking down and zooming in. Now, what looks like it might be a Photoshop mess is actually glacial flour that's been ground down at the headwaters, right where the glacier meets all of these really, really beautiful mineral rich rocks. This water flows downstream and as soon as it hits a really shallow riverbed, it starts to break up, creating a braided system. Now, it's images like these that allow me as a photographer to hopefully bring the viewer really into the moment. And what I, what I love to do is, is not only um, try to find a way to, to show you something new, but also find scale within that subject. And that's been really one of the most important things. Again, this is another river mouth in North Iceland. This is actually the very first flow of the year, which is why it's so green. Snow on the banks of the river, I believe this is the Thorsal River Mouth, which is uh, in the Highlands region. Now, 
throughout my work, I think that the idea is that you, you start to realize, well, some of these things, they can be really abstract, almost abnormal. When you've, you've never seen these subjects before, trying to add some element of scale, whether it's a plane, whether it's a paraglider, whether it's an animal or some other subject, really brings to life what you're looking at. It gives you shape, it gives you depth. It makes you understand just how natural the colors are when you see a small Piper Cub flying over a pseudo crater in the middle of the, of the, of the highlands. Now, as I'm sure many of you know, there are, there are a lot of challenges when it comes to aerial photography. And, and really today, what I actually want to do is take you guys on a bit of a backstory of how you go about creating these types of images. What do you use? Um, what types of craft? And really, how do you deal with some of these issues? Because as most of you know, it's not always like this. It doesn't always just look beautiful and, and everything's coming together peacefully. It's, it's probably more commonly a little closer to this experience where you feel like you're just giving everything you can and you're barely squeaking by with something interesting, right? It's, it's almost like going to battle. I know that for me, a lot of times when I'm sticking my body out of a plane, I feel like I've just come back from war, right? And I don't know if I have any images that are worthwhile. Pretty much everything I've shot, I'm just spraying and praying, right? You don't really know. So how do you kind of get away from this and get back to kind of creating something with, with meaning? And there's three big factors that have actually changed for me the way that I've shot these images. I started my career in film, right? As you can imagine, shooting aerial photography with film is a total nightmare. Um, the vibration from the wing, uh, the, the low battery life, and, and not being able to have a high burst is really challenging. But for me, over the last six, seven years, working really directly with Sony and working with the engineers to address my needs, we came up with the A7R III. And that camera has been, for me, the greatest tool in documenting really any project from commercial photography down to some of my favorite personal projects. Now I want to take you um, through a little bit of a, of a personal story here. I love documenting people. You see one of the things you realize that when you start to fly is that these pilots, now these are the real heroes, right? It's not the photographer taking the photograph, it's the guy who's willing to take you up. Now the reality of these guys is that the best way to really describe them is like cowboys. Okay, this is Chris Burdeen. He's a pilot based in Taos, New Mexico. And this craft you see behind him, this is something he built in his garage. Okay, and just so you understand, it's basically a motorcycle with a huge wing on the top of it, right? Big exposed motor, two seats. You're sitting right over this thing. You're, you're riding it like a horse. And in order to fly these things, you don't really need that much certification. <clears throat> so it takes a lot of trust. On Chris's body, this is an Everest suit. And what I mean by that is it's an actual suit you take to Everest. This suit has been on the top of Everest. Why? Well, let me explain. When you are shooting in the air with an exposed cockpit, all the wind is hitting you and it's the middle of winter, that 15 degrees temperature quickly goes to negative 30 when you're flying 90 miles an hour. So you need to be fully prepared. And this is one of the realities that I love. I love the feeling of photography when it can actually make you feel something when you're shooting it. And so documenting Chris and telling his story as a fellow photographer was a real joy. And at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna show a quick video about his whole experience. And he's one of the, the most um, interesting artists I've ever had a chance to work with. Now, this gives you a real perspective, right? It's basically like a tricycle with a motor with a big wing on it, okay? Now we chose this backdrop, the Colorado Sand Dunes, Great National Park. For most people who have traveled throughout the US, let me just give you a little secret here. The largest dune field in North America sits at the base of these 14,000 foot peaks in Southern Colorado. One of the most beautiful places I have ever been. Has some of the most visceral light. Why? Because it sits at about eight to 9,000 feet of elevation. The air is clear, the air is cold. These are the Sangro de Cristo Mountains, right? They get the very last bit of light. That's why they turn blood red. Now this landscape, I knew when Chris was describing it, it was unlike any other. He told me that when he started to fly, when he, first, when he built his first ultralight, which is what he calls it, he flew over these dunes and he knew from that moment he was hooked forever. The shapes, the patterns, the colors, and I, I knew that I wanted to tell that story. But I, and so I, I asked Sony, I was like, hey, I need some budget. I wanna tell this story. I wanna shoot a video about Chris. But I knew there were some challenges. Okay, and I'll be the first one to tell you, I'll probably be the first one in this whole thing to tell you that the very first iterations of the A7, there were a couple flaws, the battery life being one of them, right? It just didn't last long in cold weather. So I was really worried. But as the A9 came out, as the A7R3 came out, that completely changed. 
We were shooting in January 1st. 15 degrees in the morning, it would be about negative 20 to negative 30 in the air. And so we were putting these cameras through the absolute paces. I mean, you're basically having to, we were having to go to U-Haul, rent blankets, put them on the wings because so much ice was forming on the wings, right? I mean, these are the realities you're dealing with. It is freezing cold. The motor, the prop, there's, there's ice all over it, okay? Um, and we were attaching these cameras to the very end of the wing by a small cable, and this thing is totally exposed. It doesn't have anything covering it. There's no gloves, no heat warmers. You're basically letting this camera be totally exposed for a two to three hour flight, continually shooting photos or video. So dealing with that and never having the battery run out, that was a game changer. I would venture to say that the battery in the R3 is about three to four times better than the older versions. And it also deals incredibly well when it comes to cold weather. Now, sensor stabilization. It's a funny one because I think that when it, when it comes to imaging shows, especially when it comes to, to you know, digital photography, one of the, the, the real heroes is dynamic range. It's something that we don't mention a lot. The camera with the greatest dynamic range is gonna give you the greatest color depth. It's gonna give you the greatest ability to bring back everything that you saw. But the other thing is sensor stabilization. The fact that this camera has a five axis stabilized sensor makes a huge difference. Back in the day, it's funny to say that, we used to have to put gyro stabilizers on top of our cameras, two spinning magnet balls that would spin like this so that it would kind of have some weight to the camera. So when you shoved it out into 90 mile an hour prior winds, it would stay solid. But in this case, we were hand holding the camera, shooting with a long lens from the back seat, filming scenes like this. I shot this photograph and filmed this scene from the back seat, shooting with a 7200 out the back. I mean, usable footage at 4K doing this was, in was incredible. Right, and you're, you're moving, your subjects are moving, everything's happening very quick. These aren't these smooth transitions. This gives you a feel. I don't know if you can fully see this frame above you, but there's about four, five cameras. There's one here, Renan has one, Chris has one. There's one in the front, right? We had five cameras on these rigs. I mean, these were totally decked out as many as we could put on there, okay? Different lenses attached to each one. And these are the kind of perspectives you can get when you mount the cameras to these things. This is a wide angle looking down on Chris as he's flying. We wanted to kind of give that feeling. This is his bar. You can see he has gloves on, an Everest suit, and he has these pogies heated. He, he, I mean, you can imagine just how cold his hands are getting, but he has to still be able to control that bar and move the plane around, right? Another perspective too, looking back, this gives you a, a, a sense of just how tight this cockpit is. Now, funny story, I wasn't gonna tell this, but um, gives you a, a perspective of how real this is. I remember sitting here, <coughs> this is me on this flight, and I'm, I'm looking back and I'm like, oh, but that's so cool. And I, I'm, I'm kind of irking my way out of the corner and shooting something and I, I start to smell burnt plastic. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's, what's that? Burnt? And I'm looking around and you know, it kind of goes away and I, I get off the flight and I realize that I, my hood had come kind of undone and it was hitting the muffler and my entire jacket was melting while it was on my body. It was basically just burning up, it was catching fire. So interesting scenario, <coughs> it gives you kind of a perspective for how tight the shooting environment really is. This is a, a view of Chris basically shooting, you know, one of, the, one of the beauties of this that I, I kind of fail to mention is that we are always using the back screen, right, to shoot these shots because do you think Chris is gonna lift up his visor and put the camera to his eye? No way, there's so much wind coming at his face. So using that back screen is actually, a, the LCD is a, is a huge advantage when it comes to aerial photography, being able to point the camera down or up, articulate the screen in some capacity as well. <laughs> now I share this because I want you to understand that you're not always dealing with perfect circumstances. As a professional, I'll be the first person to tell you that I think uh, a roll of gaff tape or, uh, or duct tape is probably my first go-to tool when it comes to creating something. Like you're always using whatever you have with you. And sometimes you don't have a tripod mount, so you just tape the crap out of that thing and that's how you get it to work. Another unsung hero from this project was the little tiny Sony action cam, 4K. We were able to really mount this in any capacity in which we could. And this is actually kind of the, the views that you would get shooting a time lapse. This shows you, this is like a, a, a pretty long, almost like a, an hour long time lapse, keeps going and going. But you can see the other plane in this shot, basically we're chasing it, right? Trying to follow it. And one of the coolest things about these dunes is that these dunes, besides being the largest in North America, they're actually a perfect interpretation of the wind patterns that you find in these mountains. 
They reflect what you're seeing above. The wind passes over the mountains. It spews out this sand into this tiny place. And this is really where you get this incredible shape and pattern. Now, high frame rate, I'm going to kind of end on this note that high frame rate is, is one of these really interesting subjects. Now, what you realize is that when a subject is against the sky like this, it's really easy to catch focus. You have high contrast, you have a subject all by itself, and you're, you're, you're framing it against something like that. But, but when you're shooting a subject against something like this, it's really challenging. I mean, catching focus, it's probably one of the hardest environments. Why? Because there's no contrast there. Right? You're, you're shooting into kind of a uh, sort of a blank sheet of color and then you're hoping to catch this vehicle as it's moving 90 miles an hour and you're moving 90 miles an hour. So be able to use different types of focus, eye focus, continuous focus, and a lot of times single focus um, when it came to wider lenses was critical. Now to capture a lot of these images, images I chose to use the R3 over the A9 because 10 frames a second for me was enough, but I didn't want to compromise the quality. A lot of my work, I'm blowing up to billboard size. I'm blowing up um, to basically create huge fine art prints, and I never want to, want to hinder the quality. And that's kind of one of the reasons I chose it. The A9 would have performed beautifully in this scenario with really fast focusing and 20 frames a second, but for me, 10 frames a second was, was well enough. Now, as I kind of come to the conclusion here, I just want to share this concept that really, like, the, the reason that we as photographers, I think anybody here, tries to, I think, push ourselves outside of our comfort zone is, and not just pay lip service to it, is that we, we want to share the beauty of these places. This is the full moonrise, the blood moon, actually rising over the sand dunes. And one thing you should notice is that if you ever go there, it's the only place you can find a star dune in North America. The only other place that, that these star dunes are actually created is Oman or the Empty Quarter or Jordan. And what that means is that three distinct wind patterns are approaching these dunes and they create star-like shapes. It's one of the most otherworldly, beautiful things you can witness and to see it from above is absolutely as good as it gets in my opinion. Um, now, I, I really hope that in some way for you, photography can't just be a tool to, 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 to work, a tool to kind of you know, help you help you uh, get stamps in your passport or to make a living, although that's a really noble cause. But I hope that in some way it can help us get outside of the safe and the routine and the familiar and the known. And that's exactly what I use it for today. And that's exactly what I love to be able to share with people. Now, as I share Chris's film, um, I just want you to think and maybe, maybe listen to kind of his passion. It took Chris almost losing everything to realize that this is what he wanted to do with his life. And it's one of the most honest and meaningful stories of anybody I've ever heard. And I'm grateful to share it with you today. And thank you so much for having me, you guys. Appreciate it. dreams my whole childhood of flying above the earth, imagining what it would be like up there. The first time I actually flew in a small plane, I was 13. We were in a little metal box, Could, couldn't see that well out the window. I was a little bit uneasy. I figured, well, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Well, the Colorado Great Sand Dunes are this massive body of sand that's deposited right at the foot of a big range of mountains. Dude, look oh at that! Oh my god! Yeah, I was tripping when I was seeing that stuff. Oh my god, look at the shot. That was after sunset. Wow. It still got illuminated. Nice. I didn't really follow the route of getting a normal job. The importance was do what you love. I 
took up skiing when I was about 19. My passion kind of led me that direction where I, I wanted to be immersed and connected to everything through what I was doing. In 1999, I actually had a uh, near-death experience skiing where I got pushed off of a cliff. And that was it when I saw where I was going. It was probably a 40-foot drop. I just remember thinking, Shh, that's it, I'm dead. When I came to, I was at the bottom of the cliff sitting in snow up to my chin. I fractured my spine and fractured my wrist. And I realized that I wasn't invincible and that any moment could be my last. I began to see the world in a much bigger, all-inclusive way. And I felt like it was time to follow a deeper calling. We're uh, dealing with some freezing temps, shooting Chris, the pilot, in one of his favorite places, and uh, it's been pretty surreal. Last time I snotted so much, I thought I broke the radio. But... <laughs> Welcome to my backyard. <laughs> okay. Can you plug in Renan's radio? It still lingered in my mind and I saw hang gliders and paragliders and I knew I wanted to do something open. And I started seeing trikes, which is basically like a flying motorcycle and anything else. So yeah, it was perfect match for what I wanted to do. smooth you can take your hands off the controls and relax and just take in the scenery it's really a really an amazing feeling flying has expanded my awareness in huge ways that I'm just starting to realize this is all one huge being that all relies and connects to each other and works in relationship to each other to sustain life on this planet. I had dabbled in photography, but this sparked that creative side and I wanted to share the feeling of being up there with people. I felt like I was so called to do it. like to continue doing is reaching more people with these images of the earth and inspiring them to have hope that even in the midst of the chaos that we're in we can let this beauty a natural world inspire us to move towards a sustainable future. <laughs>